Amen, amen, amen. Glory to God. Isn't it so good to know that nothing can separate us from the love of God? I mean nothing. Can you say with me, nothing can separate me from the love of God? Now say it like you really mean it. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Amen. Because you do belong to him. The word of God says that the Holy Spirit has sealed us until the day of redemption. It is so good to know that I have been sealed. You have been sealed. God has placed his love, his mark upon you. That you belong to him. Which tells the enemy, hands off. This one's mine. It's just amazing that I, I, I imagine that sometimes God likes to throw our lives up in the devil's face. That I, in, in, in my, my mind's eye, that God has this magnificent trophy case in heaven. And every time the accuser of the brethren comes and tries to accuse us before God, and say, well, they did this, and they did this, and they said this, and they did this, and, you know, your word says that, I should be able to have them. They should be destroyed. And then God turns around and looks at his trophy case and says, there she is. There he is. There she is. There she is. You can't have them. They belong to me. And so I would just give God just 30 seconds of just praise and awesome for him because I'm in that trophy case. You're in that trophy case. You belong to him. Glory to God. The word of God says that when we get into his presence, that he is going to rejoice over us. That he himself, the creator of the universe, when we get in his presence, will rejoice over us. Will sing over us. I read that this week and it just blew my mind that when the time comes and I stand before God, that he's going to rejoice over me. I'm rejoicing over him. I'm singing over him. But it said, but when we get there, he will rejoice and sing over us. Just how much he loves us so. I mean, how much he truly loves us. Amen. So we just give him honor and glory and his praise in this house today. You may be seated. Amen. I am just so excited to be before you today with the word of the Lord for today because God gave me a word today. And I was wondering, well, Lord, what am I going to say to your people today? Because I do not take it lightly when I have to come before the people of God. Because this word is very, very precious. This word is power. This word contains the things that we need that are essential to our life because Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So this word is precious because there's life in this word. And Jesus said, lo, behold, I've come in the volume of the book. It's written of me. And so let's break the bread of life today and look into it as I want to talk about a few things today. And then because we've had a, recently had a series on purpose and I wanted to go in a different direction. But the Lord brought me back to purpose again that he wanted me to continue to share with the people on the on fulfilling your purpose, fulfilling your purpose and the importance of purpose in what it is in our life. Because I was listening to a discussion not too long ago where they were talking about purpose and the universal qualities of successful people. That there are, there are three common things that are, 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 that are just similar amongst very, very successful people. And some of these things I've, I've learned and I've also lived by in my own life. And I've, if you just give me a moment, I'd like to share these three things with you. And one of the things you have to understand that successful people have a clear purpose in life. They have a clear purpose in life. Also, successful people have a compelling reason to get out of bed in the morning. And that driving purpose keeps them on track and makes them ultimately successful. 
See, when I get up every morning, I, now, see me, I, I, I'm an early riser. I, I'm, I'm up early in the morning. I'm an early riser because I get excited about the new day. I get excited about what God is going to do that day. I get excited about what's going to happen, what's going to transpire. I'm very, very excited about that. And so me, I don't want to spend my time laying around in bed all day long trying to sleep late because I'm, I'm, a, I'm concerned I might miss something. Something exciting is going to happen. I want to see what's going on, and I like to get an early start on it. But the third thing that successful people also have is without a clear purpose, they understand that no one can be considered successful no matter how much worldly fame they achieve if they don't have a clear purpose. So not only do you have to have a purpose, you need to know what that clear purpose is. What am I supposed to be doing? Who am I? What am I supposed to be doing? And so the scripture text I want to I want to take our text today comes from Genesis, the first chapter. So if you could turn with me, if you please, to Genesis, the first chapter. Let's go to the book of beginnings. If we want to deal with purpose, let's go back to the beginning, the original purpose of why we were created in Genesis chapter one. And I want to read at verse number twenty-six. Genesis one twenty-six. And the scripture reads, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And he blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing, that moveth upon the earth. So let me just start with a, a, a little story to try to put this in context and see where we're going today. Let me start with a little story. And this story comes, there was a, a, a news release, there's a news press story that came from the Associated Press. And it was back around 19, about, about 2004. About 2004, the Associated Press had released an article about a stolen 320-year-old cello. So for those of you who may not know what that is, cello was one of the instruments in classical music. I am classically trained in classical music. I play the viola, I play upright bass, I play electric bass. But uh, cellos are also one of part of the string instruments, and it's, it's the one that's in between the upright bass and the violin and the viola. You have the cello. Like, for instance, you know Yo-Yo Ma. He's a world-famous, world-class cello player, cellist. And so there was this particular cello, and it belonged to the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra. It was part of their symbol. Now, this cello was a 320-year-old Stradivarius cello. Now, if you don't know, if you have a Stradivarius is one of the rarest instruments and one of the, fi one of the finest sounding instruments in the world. And most of them are considered priceless. If you're, if you're fortunate to be able to play, able to play on one, much less if you're fortunate to even get near one, they are so rare because of their beautiful sound quality. And so there was a 320-year-old Strat Stradivarius cello that had been missing for approximately three weeks and it had been returned to the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra after it avoided becoming the world's most expensive CD rack. So this is what happened. The primary cellist for the Philharmonic Orchestra had accidentally left this instrument outside his home one day. He left it outside, and nearby video surveillance had shown, the surveillance camera had revealed that he accidentally left it outside, a bicyclist had come along, saw it, and he stole it. He stole it, he took it. 
Now, this cello was worth $3.5 million. And someone took it on a bicycle and stole it. Apparently, he had a hard time riding his bicycle carrying this very, very large instrument. So he got about a mile and decided to dump it, and he left it by a trash bin in an alleyway. So he took this $3.5 million instrument made by master, a master craftsman by the name of Antonio Stradivari and left it lying beside a trash bin about a mile from where it was stolen. Now it just so happened, a nurse who got off of work just happened to be coming by and saw this instrument sitting by a trash bin. And so she saw it, took it, from the trash bin and placed it in the trunk of her car and left it in the trunk of her car for two days. And then she's decided, well, she was going to ask her boyfriend because her boyfriend happened to be a cabinet maker. So she said, I know what I'll do with this thing. I'll contact my boyfriend to get him to either do one of two things, either repair the instrument or I'll have him to convert it into a CD holder. She did not know the significance of the instrument until she saw a news report about it saying that, you know, you know, she heard a news report about it and realized that this is a very, very valuable instrument because in her mind, what she was going to do, she had the idea that she was going to have her boyfriend, this cabinet maker, cut open the front of it, put some hinges on it, install little shells on the inside, to make it a very, very elaborate CD case to hold CDs, not realizing that this thing was 320 years old, one of the rarest cellos made in the world because when Stradivari created these, he only made 60 of them. And of the 60 that he made 320 years ago, less than 10 were in existence today. And so she was going to make a CD case out of it until she heard about it uh, on the news. See, the Phil Los Angeles Philharmonic, they bought it about 30 years prior, and, they, and the person who, who, when they returned the instrument, the, there was a, a, a specialist who specializes in these expensive, rare instruments, and they special in restoring them. He said that the valuable instrument is damaged. They got it back, it was slightly damaged. He said, but it was repairable and it should be back in service with the Philharmonic, you know, within a couple of months. But when he heard what the nurse was going to do with this instrument by having it modified and turned into a CD holder, he nearly fainted when he heard what she was going to do with it because he couldn't just imagine that this, that this, this prized instrument could have been turned into a CD holder. To him, it was just so abominable that he just got sick every time he heard about it. And so, what, what does this tell us? Is that sometimes we have to realize that there's something valuable in every single one of you. And sometimes people may not see the value in you. But see, but God knows how valuable you are. Even if others, just like that cello, they just thought it was just a regular old instrument. It's just a piece of wood not realizing the significance and the value and how expensive this thing was. And so what I realized in my life when I heard about this story, I realized a few things in, about purpose is that when it comes to purpose, you have to discover it, you have to find it, and you have to walk in it because when you walk in it, it helps to make you come alive. And like the cellist who would take that cello and make beautiful music and make it come alive, God makes me come alive and makes us come alive when we're fulfilling our purpose, when it's being used exactly how it was created and intended to be used and to be celebrated. See, because when you're not fulfilling your purpose, your self-worth begins to diminish. When you're not fulfilling your purpose, you lose sight of just how valuable you are in God's eyes. When, you are not, when you're not fulfilling your purpose, you end up feeling like God would just turn you into a CD holder. 
You ever have one of those pity parties where you just figure, well, I just don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I just don't know what my purpose in life is. Well, maybe God ought to just, you know, just cancel me and just put me off to the side because after all, I'm not like so-and-so. I'm not as eloquent as they are or I'm not as smart as this one or I don't have the education that this other individual. And you, and you try to cancel yourself because you're looking at accomplishments of other people and you begin to diminish yourself in your own eyes. And you begin to start throwing at those kind of pity parties where you start putting yourself down because you don't recognize the value that you have to the kingdom. You don't recognize the value that God has placed in you. You don't see your own self-worth. And you begin to diminish yourself and diminish your own value. Have you, let me ask you, because what I've come to understand that God has a purpose for each of our lives. We have to discover it. We have to fulfill it. But ever, have you ever felt like you didn't have any purpose? I have. Have you ever felt like you've known your purpose, but you're not fulfilling your purpose for whatever reason? I have. Thomas Carlyle once said that a man without purpose is like a ship without a rudder, a waif, a nothing, a no man. When you have no purpose, you're like a ship without a rudder. You're just out there just sailing, and you've got no direction of where you're going. Where are you heading to? Where are you going? You're just floating. And sometimes it, life can feel like that. Have you ever felt like a ship without a rudder? Billy Sunday once said that more men fail through lack of purpose than lack of talent. More men fail through lack of purpose than lack of talent. So in Genesis, when God set our purpose, telling us to make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing. You know, these verses are nestled, you know, these verses, because the word Genesis means beginning. And we have in this chapter an account of the beginning of life as we know it. But we find in this chapter the divine revelation of the very thing that God wanted us to know about, and that is he's at the beginning of, all, of everything. He's at the beginning of it all. And so... We, 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 we look at all kind of theories and we run kind of out of rabbit holes and there's all kind of books and all kind of stuff that people are trying to figure out, trying to figure out what it is I'm supposed to be doing, my, my purpose-driven life, and there's a lot of good stuff that's out there. But we need to understand that we can't spend our wheels running down rabbit holes on, on trails that might be fun and interesting to explore, but they don't really produce any fruit. We have to really get serious about what our purpose is in pursuing it. So in the beginning, what does God do when he said, in, uh, in, in the beginning, God? Well, when God creates our purpose, well, he said he created the heavens, he created the earth. And also when we set all these different theories aside, you know, he sets the foundation for his entire Bible. Because in Genesis 1-1, what does God say? In the beginning, what? God. So if you're pursuing your purpose, if you're going after your purpose, what do you do in, John, in, in, in Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, what? God. Your purpose starts with him. Why? He created you. He created you. See, see, God, when he creates our purpose, he's not arbitrarily just throwing things around a little bit here, a little bit here, a little something there, where we just spend our lives just cruising through, you know, through life, aiming at every whim and every imagination. No, when God created, he created things on purpose for purpose. See, when he created things, everything that we saw in the creation was created because he had an end result in mind. There was something he was preparing everything for because of something, some result he wanted at the end. And so everything else that was created was to, for that purpose to reach that particular end. And so a purpose is the reason why something was done in the first place. You understand? A purpose is the reason why something was done in the first place because everything begins with that purpose with the end in mind because the purpose is a goal and all of the tasks that lead up to that goal these steps have to take have to be taken to lead to the goal that's in mind so the purpose is the why in your life and so the purpose the reason the goal the why is answered in the text I read in Genesis 1 26 28 because you see that humanity when God created humanity humanity was created to be the crowning, the crowning uh, cre uh, purpose of creation. 
When God created everything, he had us in mind of why he was creating everything in the first place. Because mankind, man and woman, was the crowning of his creation. Why? Because he created us in his image. He created us in his likeness. He created us so much like him that he had to create a world and give us some dominion to have some, some, some leadership over. Because we were so much like him. So let me create this world. Let me create this. Let me create all of these animals. Let me create all of nature and then take my crowning creation and give them dominion over everything else that I made on my, over, uh, through, through my hands. Why? Because they are so much like me that I need to give them something to have dominion over. Why? Because they're in my image, in my likeness. And so we see, we need to understand that God has a purpose for our life. We have to discover it. We have to fulfill it. And so looking at the text, there's an obvious answer and a not so obvious answer to that problem. Because part of it, what he said was to be fruitful and have dominion. And so to be fruitful and have dominion, it's clear that part of that is having children and governing the world is part of that purpose. Being fruitful and multiplying. But there's something more here, something deeper, because verse 26 informs us that we're made in his image and made in his likeness, and that being the case, there's so much more to our purpose than would initially meet the eye. Well, since God is a God of, of, of triune fellowship within the Godhead, part of our purpose is fellowship. Fellowshipping with him, primarily, and fellowshipping with each other. See, one of the things God wanted, God wanted was a family. It's one of the first things he created. He created the family. And then told us to do what? Expand that family. Be fruitful, multiply, expand that family. So we have fellowship with him, and he wants us to have fellowship with one another. See, so what's the first two commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And Jesus said the second was likened unto it. He said that you will love your neighbor, what, as yourself? Love God, love others. Two primary things. Love God, love others. And when you understand your purpose is to love God and to love one another, how can you walk with hatred in your heart? Because walking with hatred in your heart, walking with prejudice in your heart, walking with negativity in your heart, that completely is against the purpose of why you were created. To love him and to love one another. This is why Jesus said the greatest commandment was what? Love. Trying to drill that into mankind that look, God loves you John, uh, well, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? To fulfill that purpose of his love towards us. And then we, in turn, take that same love and extend it towards one another. So we have to understand, that is a key part of our purpose. And since also, since God is a God of creativity, part of our purpose is to create. He made us very, very talented. He made us the ability to create all kinds of things. All of us have a creative, uh, a creative ability that comes from him. So because he creates, part of what our purpose is, we create. We're gifted and talented in those, those various areas to be able to create. And so the objective is for us to understand that each one of us has a unique purpose that God has placed within us that is reflective of who he is. It's reflective of who he is. And so we need to understand God has a purpose for us. We must discover it. We must fulfill it. See, we have to understand it's not about just living through life just aimlessly because I know a lot of people just go through life and say, I just don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what I'm here to do. I, I just don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. What's my future? What does God want me to do? And, and right now, they're just spending their time just aimlessly walking around looking for a burning bush to say, stop. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go forth and go three blocks and then turn left, and then you're going to see a person over there, and then you're going to ask them this, and then they're going to give you... It doesn't work that way. And until they hear, have this burning bush experience, they figure that you're going to wander around aimlessly with a lot of activity, but they don't really know what their true purpose is. It kind of reminds me, when, when you don't really know what the true purpose is, it reminds me of a story that I heard about a, a Scotsman who one day decided he wanted to teach President Grant how to play golf. 
Now, at this time, golf was not very, very well known, and he wanted to teach the president of the United States how to play golf. And so he came out, put the tee in the ground, put the ball on top of the tee, pulls out the golf club, swings the golf club, completely misses the ball, hits the turf, and kicks a whole bunch of dirt and gravel and grass into the face of the president. So then he turns around, tries again, takes another swing, misses the ball, hits the turf, throws a bunch of dirt into the face of the president a second time. He did this six more times, each time missing the ball, hitting the turf, throwing dirt into the face and beard of the president until the president just looked at him and said, well, it appears that this sport gives you a lot of exercise, but I don't understand what the purpose of the ball is. Since he didn't hit the ball, he did not understand what the ball was. And so when you don't understand that purpose, it could easily make you think that it's something else when you don't fail, when you fail to see the purpose of what that is for. And so, so many people have a fair amount of exercise in this game of life, but they seem to miss what their true life's purpose is. Gifted in the exercise, completely missing the purpose. So now it can be said that looking at scripture, that our chief aim in life is to reconnect with God. This is true. That's great. But you know what? It doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with just reconnecting with God. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the word of God says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So the question is, so what are our good works? How do we truly discover God's purpose for our lives? Well, we are a valuable instrument, but how do we prevent ourselves from becoming some worthless CD holder? Well, one, we need God to show us. You gotta spend time before God. That takes time in prayer. That takes time in getting on your face before God. He'll show us. Yes, there's an obvious component of not only following God, but we have to live as a light in a dark world. But what has God has gifted to you? You have to ask, what is your purpose? Well, personally, I wish I could tell you, but that's something between you and God. I can't tell you your purpose. No one can tell you your purpose. Only God can tell you your purpose, and it's your responsibility to get before him to find out what your purpose is. He told Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I have toward you. You know, plans to, plans to bless you and pro, not, not to harm you, to give you a hope in the future. He said, but if he already knows what the plans are for your life, well, don't you think you need to ask the one who's got the plan? Don't you need to seek the face of the one who has the plan for your life? So you have to get before him to find out what that plan is. What we need to understand is that God has that purpose for our life, and we have to discover it, fulfill it. So how do we find our unique purpose in life? Well, the best way to find it is it begins with obedience to God. Numbers chapter 9, verse 23. If you could turn with me to Numbers chapter 9, verse 23. It begins with obedience to God. In Numbers chapter 9, verse 23, it says, At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in their tents, and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Now, we find purpose in obedience to God. Why? Because the Israelites traveled and they camped as God guided. When God said, okay, we're going to have camp here, they stopped because remember during that time when they were traveling with the tabernacle, God was during by day, he was a cloud, uh, he was a cloud by day and he was a pillar of fire by night. And as this cloud and pillar of fire moved, that's when the priest would break down the tabernacle pack it up, and they would follow it into where it rested next. And wherever it rested next, that's when they would reassemble the tabernacle all over again. But they would follow God. So when the time came to rest, 
They would follow God when he would move, and they would stop wherever God stopped. Wherever God went, they went. Wherever God stopped, they stopped. They rested where God said to rest, and they, they moved when God said to move. They followed him very, very closely. And so when you follow God's guidance, you will know that you are where God wants you, whether you're moving or you're staying in one place. You'll know you're right where he wants you to be at that time. So now, you're, right now, all of us who are here in the sanctuary and those who are walking online, right now, you are physically somewhere right now. And so instead of praying, God, what do you want me to do next? You should be praying this, God, what do you want me to do while I'm right here? What do you want me to do where you have me right now? Too many of us are so focused on what we should be doing next that you're completely missing what you should be doing now. Where you are right now. He has a purpose for where you are right now. There's a reason why you are where you are right now. Nothing is by accident. Nothing is by chance. And so instead of asking God, what do you want me to do next? Ask God, what do you want me to do while I'm right here? See, direction from God is not just for your next big move. He has a purpose in placing you where you are right now. So begin to understand God's purpose for your life is by discovering what he wants you to do when? Now. Let's say that again. Now. It starts with obedience. It continues as we trust God with our lives. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. Now here we are going to help you to help you understand that purpose and to seek that purpose. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. And the scripture reads, So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Now it doesn't say in some of your ways. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and then what comes next? And he shall direct your path. When you take the time to acknowledge God, he will direct your path. He will give you your guidance. So to receive God's guidance, here we have Solomon who wrote this particular proverb telling us that we must acknowledge God in all of our ways. Just don't make snap decisions without consulting God first. Get before him. Get his wisdom. This means turning over every area of our life over to him. Turn every area of your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and about a thousand years later, Jesus emphasized this same truth that Solomon said. Jesus emphasized it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And, and Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, he's telling us, look at our values, look at our priorities, and what is important to you. See, in what areas... We see, we have to really sometimes slow down and stop and ask ourselves, what areas have we not, have we not taken the time to really acknowledge him? What areas have we failed to seek his advice? See, in many areas of our life, we see, we, we, there's a lot of areas in which we do acknowledge God, but then there's some areas where we get to get into our own, you know, think that we're so smart and think we just know everything that we have certain expertise in certain areas and so we know better than God. But it's in those areas where you attempt to go, and what we try to do, we try to restrict God in those areas because we already acknowledge him in some areas, but you know, God, I got this. You know, after all, you know, I, I got a master's degree in this, so I got this. I got a PhD in this, so I got this. And so we, 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 don't, we restrict or ignore his influence and it's when you take the time that you restrict God his influence, or you ignore his influence that will cause you grief and get you into trouble. So he said in the scripture, he didn't say in some of your ways, acknowledge him. He said in all of your ways, acknowledge him 
and he will direct your path. And so we have to understand that we have to make God and make him a vital part of everything we do, not some things we do. We have to make him a vital part of everything we do. And when we make him a vital part of everything we do and we acknowledge him in all of our ways, he will guide us because we will be working to accomplish his purposes. See, when you acknowledge him, he'll give you his purpose for your life. And you know what? When you get his purpose for your life, it works. Why? It's his plan. And so the three things are, it starts with obedience to God. It continues as we trust God with our lives. And the third one, it becomes clearer as we work at becoming like Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. If you can turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. And the scripture reads, Therefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. See, the our calling that the scripture is referring to as Christians is to become like Christ. To become like Christ. As Romans 8.29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, this conforming is a gradual, lifelong process. It's not something that's just, one day I'm just going to pray and the next day I got it. It doesn't work that way. This is a lifelong process that you will have in your walk with the Lord that's going to be completed when you see Christ face to face. As in 1 John verse 3, verse 2, which says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and does it not yet appear what we shall be? But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So until that time, that glorious time when we meet him face to face and we become just like him, we continue to go through that, that, that process where we begin to be conformed into the image and to the likeness of the Son of God. And that process will be completed once we see him face to face. Glory to God. See, to be worthy of this calling means to, to want to do what is right and what is good as Christ would. See, we have to understand because in doing this, see, we're, we're not perfect yet, but we're moving in that direction. See, in this life, you know, we're going to make mistakes. That's why we have Jesus Christ, our advocate, who's always making intercession, you know, for us on our behalf. Why? Because we, we mess up in life from time to time. And we're not perfect yet, but we're moving in that direction as God works in us and the Holy Spirit continues to change us and to, and to operate in us and we yield, continue to yield to him. We start making fewer and fewer mistakes because we start following the voice of the Holy Spirit and it's not following our own flesh. So this is what I want to challenge you with this evening. Have you found your ultimate purpose, purpose in simply knowing God, having a relationship with him? And if you do know God, have you discovered or are you fulfilling your unique purpose of what God wants you to do? And if you feel like you haven't discovered it yet or know it and you aren't walking in it, well, I, I want to challenge you to evaluate your life right now. I want to challenge you. Evaluate your life right now and ask yourself if you are obeying, trusting, and allowing yourself to be transformed by Christ. Are you obeying? Are you trusting? Are you allowing yourself to be transformed by him? There's something that Mark Twain wrote shortly before his death. He wrote, A myriad of men are born. They labor, they sweat, they struggle, they squabble, they scold, they fight, they scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Then age creeps upon them. Infirmities follow. Those they love are taken from them. And the joy of life is turned to aching grief. It, the release, comes at last. The only unpoisoned gift earth had ever had for them. And they vanish from a world where they were of no consequence. 
a world which will lament them a day and forget them forever. Powerful words. See, the reality is that when we know our purpose and we fulfill it, it will not be said that our life was of no consequence. Understand that. The reality is when you know your purpose and when you fulfill it, it will not be said that our life was of no consequence. Because once, we once we're gone, and certainly if we follow after God's purposes for our life, it will not be said that there were negative consequences in our life. Because when you are in Christ Jesus and you are following after the things of God, no matter what life throws at you, you win. You win. It doesn't matter what the world, what the enemy, what life throws at you. You win. I, I, I learned something a, a few weeks ago when they said that, they were talking about what's the worst possible thing that can happen to you in life. Well, something could happen in you can end up possibly getting killed. But they said, well, what's the worst thing about that? What happens after that? Well, if something happens and you get killed, well, you go to heaven and you're with the Lord. And they said, and that's a bad thing? When you begin to understand that the worst possible thing that could happen to you could take you and actually be the absolute best thing that ever happened to you because you end up, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you end up in the presence of God. And so when you begin to understand that no matter what life throws at you and the worst possible thing could happen, I end up in the presence of God, it changes your perspective about life. That no matter what life throws at you, even if the worst thing happens, I'm in God's presence. That's why I begin to understand what Paul was saying, that he said that I'm caught between two, two mindsets of whether to go home to be with the Lord, which is far greater, or to just he said, stay here with you foolish Galatians. But either way, he was going to preach the gospel. So if I'm here, I'm going to keep fulfilling my purpose of what God has called me to do. And when that purpose is up, no matter what life throws at me, I'm with the Lord. So either way, I, you walk with no fear. You walk with no, no despondency because you recognize no matter what happens, you win. You win. The tragedy is that too many of us live our life as if there are no negative consequences felt by others. But when we live our lives on purpose, on God's purpose, we will not only minimize our negative outcomes, we will maximize our positive ones. Because you know what you're called to do. You're walking in what God's called to do. And because you know your purpose was, was God-given, you know that nothing's going to stop you from fulfilling that purpose. So what is your purpose? See, we will make a difference not just in our families when we're, focused, when we're working on our purpose and operating in it. We make a difference not just in our families, but also in the kingdom of God. So what is your purpose? So do you know? So let me close with this one final thought. There was a rich man who was separated from his, his mother, and he was trying to think of a, a very, very creative birthday present he could give to his mother because he knew he didn't... He didn't see her as much as he wanted to see her, and quite often she was alone and, and, and by herself. And so he was thinking of a, a, of a great gift that he could give her that would have her entertained and you know, that she could spend some time with, that, that would keep her entertained so she won't feel so lonely. And so he wanted this present to outshine all other presents he had ever given her in her life, and so he read an article about this, this expensive bird and this bird was a phenomenal talking bird that had a vocabulary of over 4,000 words. And not only did it have, it could speak 4,000 words, it could speak in numerous languages. It's a bilingual bird that can speak in multiple languages, over 4,000 words, and could sing three different operatic areas. He could sing opera, talk, sing. He said, this would be great. This will keep my mom entertained. She'll love this bird. They'll be talking all the time. She's going to love it. So he immediately went out and he bought this bird for $50,000. Bought this beautiful bird and had this bird shipped and delivered directly to his mother. So the next day, he called his mother, excitedly called her up to find out how does she enjoy the bird? How does she like it? 
Did she receive it? How did you enjoy it? What do you think of the bird? He asked his mother. And she replied, it was delicious. <laughs> Thank you. When your purpose is unknown, how sad does that make the heart of God when your purpose is unknown? When your purpose is unknown, how much do it, does it negatively impact those around us? When the purpose is unknown, how much have we diminished the blessings of God in our life? What we need to understand is that God has a purpose for our life. We must discover it and we must fulfill it. Amen. If you need an envelope for your giving, please lift your hand nice and high so our facelifters can see it. If you're paying by check, make that payable to Light of Joy or simply the initials LOJ will suffice. For those of you who are watching online on our YouTube, our Twitter, and our Facebook Live channel, there's an online giving button linked directly above the video that you're watching. And for those of you who are paying, uh, who like to text to give, you can text your offering uh, directly to our text to give number. That number is 770-504-4840. That's 770-504-4840. Also, you have the option to go directly to our website at lightofjoy.org or lightofjoy.com, and you will see an online giving button there that you can just click that and just... Uh, give your tithes and offerings directly there online. We make it very, very easy and very, very convenient for you to be able to, be able to give as God has increased you pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week at your, early, at your convenience. So we want to thank you for that. And thank you for your obedience and thank you for your faithfulness and giving and helping us to support the, the things that are being done here at Light of Joy so we can continue to preach the gospel and teach the gospel and fulfill our mission of reaching the lost and teaching the found. So we want to thank you for your faithfulness. And as you know, during this season, we're continuing on with phase two of our building project. We've gone from phase one and we're now getting into phase two of our building project. And so we will continue to speak life to the vision that God has given us here to fulfill the purpose of what God has called us to do here at Light of Joy. And so if you would, I would ask all of you if you could please stand with me at this time as we begin to declare our building fund declaration as we declare it and speak in faith. Amen, if you can, if you have the ability to stand and stand in faith with us. Amen. We're just waiting for our building fund confession to come up. Thank you, audio ministry, video ministry. Thank you so much. Let's recite. Lord, we willingly, faithfully, and cheerfully worship you with our giving through tithes and offerings. We release our faith and finances so that all our ministry facilities will be built and our vision will be established in the earth. We believe that as we sow seed to establish the vision of your house, you will also establish ours. Therefore, as a result of our obedience and love and giving, we thank you for raises and increases, borrowed money to be returned to us, bonuses and increased commissions, rebates, dividends, gifts and inheritances, canceled debt and surprise checks in the mail. We bless you for blessing the health of our bodies, the sanity of our minds, and the quality of our relationships. We honor you for the divine favor that you bring to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be served.
couple of brief announcements we have. A reminder to all of the ladies of joy and joy girls in the house that the joy girls and ladies of joy will be meeting this Saturday at 10 o'clock. And I know if it's anything like, like what they've had in the past and what they've been setting up for the past couple of days, it's going to be a phenomenal event. So all ladies, please come out this Saturday. At, uh, we are meeting live this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Also, for the marriage enrichment power couples, uh, they have a communication and comedy. Uh, that'll be on Sunday, May the 16th, uh, starting with the games at 1.30. So all power couples, please come out. To all married couples and engaged couples who have a date set, you are invited to come out to that. Of course, they're going to have a wonderful dinner, and child care will be provided, and that will be featuring the comedian Cyrus Steele. Also, Light of Joy Bible Institute is open. Amen. We had our first classes yesterday, and it's not too late. You can definitely come to Light of Joy Bible Institute. And one of the beautiful things is we have our own education wing with some beautiful classroom that God has provided for us here. So you have the opportunity, if you haven't taken it yet, you can take Powerful Victorious Living. You can also take the Joseph Sango course, I Was Broke, Now I'm Not. Now, if you haven't taken this financial course, don't let the name throw you off because it's a powerful course because if you found yourself in some financial distress, I highly recommend you consider taking this course because he has the ladder, the nine step principles in that ladder that can help get you out of debt and get you on a proper financial track because you cannot fulfill your purpose when you're broke or when your finances are out of order. And one of the things that the Word of God says is that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. But it's not because the knowledge wasn't available. The knowledge was available, but the people rejected the knowledge that God was making available to them. So let's, let's get out of our own way. Get the knowledge that God is trying to get to us so we can make improvements in our lives. So that course is available as well. And also for those who want to enhance your skills and take, your, take things to another level, we are also offering the American Sign Language course and, it, uh, and that's at the beginner's level. I mean, we have some wonderful instructors that will teach you how to communicate in sign language starting at the beginner's level so you can communicate if you have family members that are deaf or you like to communicate with the deaf community, you'll be able to, to speak with them in their language and understand their culture. And it's a wonderful thing to do. So those courses are available to you. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I believe that covers all that we have, and thank you, God. And so let's begin, and we're going to have our prayer, our, our benediction, and we're going to get out here at a good hour. Amen? Glory to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, dear God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your great. Thank you for the love that you have for your people, oh God, and how it is your desire to see us to do well, to be conformed to the image of your dear son and to see us fulfill our purpose in life, dear God. 
to fulfill the mission that you've assigned every single one of us, to be able to run the race that you've assigned every single one of us to run so we could complete our course and finish our race and finish it successfully, dear God, to be effective witnesses, dear God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you and we just give you praise for all that has been said and for your Holy Spirit operating in our lives, dear God, and causing us to become successful and to fulfill the mission that you've given us. Watch over your people, dear God. Protect them, keep them safe from any hurt, harm, or danger, or accidents of any kind, dear God, as we travel from this place to our respective homes and back here to the house of God. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in the majestic name of Jesus that we love so much. Amen, amen, amen. Go in peace and we'll see you on Saturday, Joy Girls, and Sunday for service.